All right, functional programming for scientific software. Um, this is my first time using Keynote, and I have to say it really beats the hell out of uh, PowerPoint, which I hate. Um, and uh, so I thought I'd, after a life of doing sucky PowerPoints, I thought I'd see if I could get it a little better. Um, I found this poster online, uncredited. It's a, you know, a, a manipulation of an old uh, early Soviet propaganda poster. Um, and so that is, I'm putting that in as a little bit of a warning that um, I may be a little, a little cult-like about this right now. Uh, but I genuinely, I genuinely believe it, too. Um, but I do recognize that, that I may be a little over the top. Are you about to teach us Lambda calculus? No, if only I had another five hours. <laughs> um, so this is roughly what I'm going to talk about, right? First of all, functional programming, what, what, what does that even mean? Why functional programming? If you buy the functional programming argument, why functional programming for scientific software in particular? Uh, and if you buy that, why, do you, why use closure for that? Um, and then there will be just a couple other little things at the end. So what is functional programming? Um, it's, a, it's kind of a loose definition, um, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, it's a, there's not really a good way to thoroughly formalize it, but, hi, Imka. Uh, can hold on yeah. Sorry for no problem. So I'm just saying, what is functional programming? Here's the Wikipedia definition. Um, functional programming is a programming paradigm, a style of building the structure and elements of computer programs that treats computation as the evaluation of mathematical functions and avoids changing state and mutable data. Uh, that is, um, I think, a pretty reasonable uh, definition. And so I'm going to unpack some parts of that a little bit. Um, in functional programming, maybe unsurprisingly, you're really focusing on writing functions, uh, which is to say pure functions which aren't having side effects somewhere off in another piece of your code. You say um, an array of functions? Is that what you said? You're really pure functions. Pure functions. Pure functions, yeah. Uh, which just means a function a function with no side effects elsewhere. If you hand it the same inputs, it will always, always give you the same outputs without some other part of the state of your program affecting that. Um, the flip side of that, right, I mean, you tend to have a somewhat limited amount of state in your program overall, and what you have is kind of kept under tight control and only changed at well-defined points. Um, this can, seems completely insane when you first try and do it, uh, and then when you get used to it, it's really natural and easy. Um, another part of that definition typically is that functions are first class, which just means that um, they are... Uh, like any other variable. You can uh, return them from other functions, you can pass them around, you can provide them as parameters to functions, and so on. Um, one of the reasons that I think this is really good is that it's fundamentally modeled on a mathematical abstraction rather than, uh, or an abstra not only a mathematical abstraction, but an abstraction of math mathematics rather than uh, an abstraction about, that's about computer hardware, right? Most of the code that we write, we're constantly dealing th with things that are essentially representations of the hardware architecture, right? Here's the state of this piece of memory at this particular time. I want to flip it. Uh, functional programming kind of, kind of walks away from that and says we don't need to spend so much time uh, shaping our code around, around the way the computer is structured. Um, how do you do it? I'm not going to say. Uh, I just don't, there's not time in this presentation. Uh, the only motivation for this presentation is why does it matter, not how would you do it. But again, I'm very happy to at length go into how. Why don't you, do you have a Python interpreter somewhere? Why don't you write a, why don't you iterate over a list? I have I, I, I have an agenda. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No. Um, I will I will note uh, in passing that uh, functional program is not new. There's nothing particularly new about it. Uh, it's based on the uh, lambda calculus, the 
which is that fundamental abstraction, which Andrew mentioned, which was developed in the 30s. Uh, the first full functional programming language uh, called FP uh, was released in 1977 by uh, John Backus, who uh, also wrote Fortran. I just learned that yesterday. I had never, never heard that. I thought that was cool. Um, so that's, that's, that's basically the what of functional programming. The, uh, the why is kind of the bigger question. Um, it's a better way to think, and it's a better way to write software. That's a big claim. Um, but I really believe it, and I hope that this talk will uh, get a little bit of the way into why. Um, and here's a few specific reasons. Minimizing state and kind of keeping state on a leash makes it a lot easier to get stuff right the first time. Um, hey, hey. Yeah. I'm not a software engineer, so could you, like, say a few words what state means in this context? Ah, uh, yeah. So... Um, let's just say it's the value of a variable that's available to your program. Uh, so, you know, in a language like C or Fortran, really you're just talking about a variable. The word is used most, I feel like, in object-oriented languages where it is something really fundamental to objects may, may that I? they have state. May I? Uh, quickly. Let's say you got an, an array of years of data. Uh, an example of state would be when you're processing the years, is this a leap year? The variable, is this a leap year, is state. Yeah. So in short, a variable, right? And So your, your program, you, you, you'll have like two versions of your loop. One that does things normally for regular years and one thing that, that does leap years. The state is whether you're in a leap year. Yeah. So you can do it this so, way. You write let, let, let's, takes it into account. Andrew, I gotta get that. I, I gotta. Oh, okay. I gotta tell you, Janda. Somebody's in here at eleven. Um, and so it's, I think it's easier to get it right the first time, and it's easier to keep it right. Uh, I think we're all familiar with having a code base that kind of gets more fragile over time, uh, and functional programming goes a long way toward preventing that. Um, which is another way of saying it kind of minimizes the cognitive cost of having a big code base. You know, you get something right, and then you just forget about it. That function is always going to do the same thing. It's not going to have unexpected interactions with some other part of your code. And so you can forget all about how it's implemented once you've gotten it, once you've written it. It, takes, it, it sometimes takes a little extra work up front to write it. But there's a, a really big payoff there. Another payoff is that concurrency and, and parallelism get a lot easier. Uh, those are not things that are maybe ever going to be truly easy, but in most programming languages, it's way too hard. It's too hard. It's like too hard to do, really. Um, functional programming makes it a lot more feasible. Uh, and one other thing that's lovely is very often you get to just describe what you want to do rather than the details of how to do it. That's, again, about it not being based around the computer architecture. So uh, for loops and counters, right, I mean, those ultimately are a way of um, talking about how you want to do something. Like, you generally don't care that there's a counter. It's just a way of getting to the thing you really want to get at. Uh, if it turns out we have a bunch of extra time, I'll show an, I'll show an example of that. Uh, and it lets you write simpler software uh, that doesn't necessarily, and I mean something rather specific, right? I mean less tangled up, right? You don't get, you don't have, end up with like a spaghetti code base that's all, all the parts are kind of tangled up in each other and know about each other. And I feel like we all shoot for that no matter what language we're writing, but functional programming I think helps a lot. Um... So that's why functional program. Oh, and um, one other last thing. Bit there, the, 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 oh, you want to go? A bit about industries that adopted it. Yeah, I'm just saying I won't go back because then I've got to actually recreate the state of that slide. But um, <laughs> it's just uh, it's just saying that the industries that have that have widely adopted this approach are like the banking industry and finance, for example, places where it's like lots of concurrent, stuff. lots of it's concurrent stuff, up. and you have to get it right, and there. are problems if you like you do not want to screw up and you know cause say the flash crash 
on the stock market. Um, so getting it right matters to them, and it, and it matters to us. And because it matters to us, that's why I think this is a good approach. Um, I will simply skip this slide, actually, because okay, I don't think we have time. But persistent data structures, those are a lot of how functional programming gives you a lot of this ability and power. And I'm just really going to bypass it because, again, we just don't have time on that. So that's why functional programming. The next question is why functional programming for scientific software in particular? Um, the reason I think is that right, what we do here, first and foremost, is we do, um, uh, we do uh, transformations on data. Right, which is to say, basically, we're evaluating mathematical functions on data. And that really is what functional programming is about. Uh, sometimes our programs look like they're doing something else, like converting between data formats, creating data visualizations, but generally speaking, we can still think of those as a set of functions applied to a data set. Right, to, to create a transformation, which is the other format or the, the chart or whatever it is. But in particular, kind of the core of what we do, um, you know, which is to say, you know, kind of st like strict scientific transformations of data, that's, that's just the heart and soul of functional programming and where it really shines. This is actually going much faster than I thought. Uh, so why closure? If you buy all of those arguments, why do it with closure in particular? There are various options uh, for functional languages, and I should say, I should say, right? I mean, this is it's kind of a loose approach. You can do functional programming uh, in different languages but uh, uh, that are not functional languages inherently, but functional, functional languages make it much easier. So Clojure is a modern functional Lisp on the Java virtual machine. Um, and I'll try to unpack every part of that a little bit. It's kind of a dense definition, but every, and every part of it kind of matters in terms of why choose Clojure. Okay. So for <laughs> slides are much funner in Keynote. Can I just say that this is so much? This was so much easier than doing PowerPoint. Um, so functional—that's that's the stuff I've been talking about up till now. Um, you can do functional programming. This is what I was saying in in almost any language. But arguably, it t it takes a functional language, I think, to really learn functional programming. I spent for a couple years, off and on. I really tried to bring a functional approach to Java code and the Python code. Um, and I saw, you know, some small percentage of the benefit. But the thing is, I would, I would do it in a functional way until it really got hard to do it that way because I didn't know enough about functional programming. And then I would fall back on state. And to some extent, once you take something that is functional, having it be functional gives you a lot of benefits. But then as soon as you sort of corrupt that with state, as soon as state sneaks into the middle of your stuff, you lose a big chunk of those benefits. Um, that's not to say, I mean, the reality is that basically all software, except for sort of academic toy software, is in some sense dealing with state, where we're trying to have an effect on the world, we're trying to keep track of what we're doing, we're trying to keep track of whether it's a leap year, of what years we've already processed and which ones we haven't. So it's not a question about trying to truly get rid of state, although interestingly you can try to take that approach in some academic languages, but it's about um, really isolating that state so that, you know, the large majority of the code that you've written is just these pure functions that are just taking taking inputs and always giving you the same output based on those inputs. Um, 
So from my point of view, it makes sense to learn a functional language in order to learn functional programming. Closure is a functional lisp. Lisp is scary. The parentheses are in the wrong place. Um, it was incredibly off-putting to me. It was everything's incredibly... Reversed. Everything's reversed. It's, it was really yeah. off-putting to me. It felt really alien to me <coughs> for a while. Um, it, but after a while, it just stops being weird. And it makes, the, and it makes sense. And, you know, 90% of what you need is an, an editor that handles those parentheses well. Um, I'll rec I'll, I've got one in the resources, but most of the major IDEs are set up to be Lisp aware, either with or without a, a plugin, right? Um, VI and Emacs are both great about it. Eclipse is great about it. Well, Eclipse is intelligent. Eclipse is all right, as I recall. I mean, it wasn't. I agree. Eclipse Eclipse is not nearly as good, but yeah, IntelliJ does a really a really nice one. Yeah, yeah. And then white paper. Uh, oh, yeah, we'll get into that. Um, Lisp gives you power that nothing else can give you. Um, Guy Steele, who's been uh, involved in writing and shaping more computer languages than anyone else I'm aware of, uh, said, um, if you give someone Fortran, he has Fortran. If you give someone Lisp, he has any language he pleases, uh, which I really like. Uh, it's a lot of it's a lot of power. Um, that said, right? I mean, you can ultimately ignore a lot of that power uh, until and unless you decide that you want to mess with it. Um, Excuse me, second. Um, yes, I'm, I'm not a software engineer either, but um, I think I've heard of Lisp, like mm -hmm. like back in the '80s when I was in college. I just, I mean, it's been around a long time. Oh, yeah, 19, 1959. Okay, have there been, like, like enhancements? Very much so. Included? Yeah, very much so. And, um, you know, in particular, Lisp really, to some extent, defines a family of languages um, as opposed to a very specific implementation. And, um, but even sort of, Common Lisp, which is kind of the most most common one, you know, has really evolved over time in some of the same ways that, for example, Fortran has, where, you know, I mean, Fortran 95 doesn't look that much like Fortran 77. And your stereotypes about Fortran 77 don't necessarily apply to Fortran 95. And that's very true of this. You know, a lot of people formed um, uh, ideas about Lisp in the 70s and the 80s that are not necessarily true at all now. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit, uh, some of that. One of the really critical things of using a Lisp is that you get a REPL or read eval print loop, which is kind of, right, I mean, a console that you can use to interact with your, your code and with the state of your running program. And so there are other things that give you that. It's one, one of the reasons I feel like that a lot of people like IDL, um, that people like MATLAB, that you can be sort of in the thick of things. You can almost you can, you can almost write your 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 program at in the console, and then kind of pull it out into a finished form. Uh, and I would argue I would argue nobody does that better than Lisp, and that's because there are certain advantages again that really co go all the way down to the bottom of this this fundamental abstraction that it's based on. Um, Develop your software interactively. Uh, also, you can shape you kind of you, you can really shape the language toward the problem in a way that you that you can't do with something that's not a Lisp. Uh, and in particular, that lends itself really well to creating domain-specific languages. Uh, that's very very easy in a Lisp, uh, and those are great for scientific software, in my opinion. Um, I mean, any code base that we're making. Any substantial code base that we're making for scientific software tends to have like the first little hints, at least, of a domain-specific language where we are in some sense defining, you know, concepts, whether those be classes or structs or some other representation that let us talk about our data the way it meaningfully is to us. Um, 
particularly as as meteorologists and climatologists. Um, I think that can actually go a lot further. Uh, and my experience with that is that I built a domain-specific language for CRN um, that was aiming to do exactly that, to uh, let the scientists I was working with access and manipulate and visualize CRN data uh, without having to think a lot about things like how is this stored in the database. Um, and there's stuff I would do differently now, but it's still it's still somewhat in use, right? Yeah, Scott? it's yeah. still constantly in use. Yeah. Um, Can you give an example of an invocation in this domain-specific language? I'd have to pull it out. Uh, but basically, you could say, "Get me all the data for this station around this time." Yeah, you could say something like, "For all for all stations which are in Colorado and which have altitude above three thousand feet." Uh, uh, you know, give me all of that and graph that against time with, uh, you know, error bars, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the two most famous and widely used DSLs are SQL and Excel, Excel spreadsheet macros. Mm -hmm. But you mean, but you mean specifically the CRN one? Yes. I think, yeah. Um, and, and that went okay. I, I, proto I, I did that in Python. Um, uh, if if I had known closure or another Lisp at the time, I could have done it much faster, and it would have been more powerful and kind of in every way better. Um, and again, you can you can kind of ignore ninety percent of the lispiness of closure if you want to. It's there if you want it, but you don't have to dive into that that world. Um, so it is a modern functional Lisp. Uh, which solves a few important problems. Um, it solves the fragmentation problem that historically there have been many implementations of Lisp and they've not been particularly compatible. Uh, there's been, you know, if you're working in Lisp, you know, there's usually some <coughs> historically been some complicated way to try and even get it up and running, much less fine libraries that are probably poorly documented. It's just been a very fragmented language, uh, and Clojure kind of kind of really solves that um, by providing sort of all of these things that no other Lisp, I think, has really had in the past. Um, it tends to favor practicality over purity. Uh, some of the history of Lisp is about, uh, re, you know, sort of academic languages that are, um, you know, really right and that you can prove things about in a formal way and so on. And those are, those are great for, for doctoral theses, but they often are not great for actually getting a bunch of stuff done when you need to. And closure really explicitly uh, favors practicality over purity. Um, pretty much everything you would want is easily available. Uh, in terms of libraries, uh, of course, obviously, here you know, in our context, you are always sometimes going to find um, uh, specialized scientific libraries that are really specialized to a single language, uh, and and of course, there's no way to like perfectly fundamentally solve that in another language. But, and I think I get to this in a later slide, but um, I get to this in a later slide. Let's just say you've got lots of libraries available to you, and they're and a lot of them are really good. So if something runs on the JVM, maybe close your case. Yes, that's the next slide. Yeah, that's but yeah, that's that's the point. You've got immediate, easy access to every Java library out there, um, and that's a big that's a really big win because that is a very big, very rich ecosystem. Uh, Documentation is excellent. Um, it is stable. It is future-proofed in some ways I'll, I'll get into in a little bit. Uh, it is very definitely enterprise-friendly because it is, is based around the Java ecosystem. Um, and, and the community is very friendly and helpful, and that's been another of LISP's big 
problems historically is that it's had a reputation for being really unfriendly to newbies. You know, you come in and you're like, I don't understand how to do this. Why is this parenthesis weird? And they're like, go learn about the lambda calculus. You know, don't bother us until you know what you're doing. Uh, and that is not true uh, of closure at all. That reputation has not always been deserved, but to some extent, I think it really has been. Um, so the final piece of that, right, it's a modern functional Lisp that runs on the Java virtual machine. And that is, in a lot of ways, a really critical piece of why I'm trying, I'm advocating for it in this context. <coughs> um, as James brought up, the biggest reason or one of them is that you've got all the Java libraries, like, boom, immediately available to you. They're trivial to call. There's, like, no, no hassle, no ceremony at all. If you can call it in Java, you can call it just as easily in, in Clojure. Um, another huge benefit in our particular context, uh, let's see, no one, no one here is associated with ITB, are they? No. <laughs> Um, I say no ITB burden because, and that's true, and it's because from an IT perspective, this is just another Java library, and we are always free to download and use Java libraries at will. The fact that from a developer perspective, it's actually another language is great, but in terms of challenges with ITB, uh, which I have occasionally encountered in other contexts, uh, it kind of means that you're not facing those. Um, and that uh, approach of using a language that runs on the JVM and looks like Java from an IT perspective is one that's been uh, successfully used here at the, in the building a number of times uh, with Jython, with Groovy. I'm not necessarily saying go out and write major production systems in it right now. It would probably be sensible if you were interested to start with code that mainly was code you were going to use or a small team was going to use as opposed to being a major part of NCDC's kind of production output. But I would also love to see us get closer to that as time goes on. Uh, Java, Java itself, it's all right, man. Um, I'm not sure I know anybody who's like passionate about Java. People are like, yeah, it's all right, and it is. Uh, but the but the Java virtual machine is great. Um, and here's another case where a lot of people have. Uh, uh, faulty stereotypes that are that are a little older. Um, Java used to be slow. The JVM used to be slow. That is really not true anymore. Uh, and the JVM is is just very, very stable and very solid now. And you know, used in a million places. Um, Can I ask a question? Please. The JVM is great because it's. Like platform independent kind of thing. That's a plus. That's a big plus. Uh, there, there are rarely issues with um, having to screw with your build based on what machine you're going to run it on. That's a big help. Um, it's also a big help that it's uh, pretty ubiquitous. It's a help that it's fast and it's reliable. Um, I mean, Python, as much as I like it as a language, it's not fast. That might change. There are signs that it's changing. But right now it's not fast. And we do a lot of stuff around here that has to be fast. Okay. And then with regard to the speed, uh, Diana, I'm sorry if I'm putting you no, on the spot, but um, Diana in the past year or so did some benchmark performance tests um, with people in Java and, and at least Fortran had to do with a specific project that I think mm -hmm. you've been a little bit involved in, maybe not. Um, I've, heard, I've heard a lot about it, but I've not yeah. touched it myself. Read, Programming a, a major uh, yeah. data crunching yeah. uh, algorithm, yeah. and and she decided that Fortran was going to have much greater performance yeah. than Java. Now. So, yeah. 
So I'm kind of curious, you know, based on what you just said. That's a great question. That's a, I mean, that's an, it's an important question, and um, I have not myself seen that code. I have a lot of faith in Diana. She's a really good programmer. Um, it may be that there are specific approaches that might have might have improved the discrepancy a little bit. Um, but but I think it's very true. You know, Java is not now and may never be um, as fast as Fortran. Uh, it is, in general, well within an order of magnitude. And often that's enough. Maybe it, it's not always. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about you know what kind of what some of the options are around that. You um, get so many more benefits by using Java other than performance. I mean, you, you, what you pay for is or what you have to cost is your performance. But what you get is I mean, you get a lot of other goodies with Java that you just can't. You just can't. You know, you have to hire someone like Diana to cook up all the things that you kind of get for free for for Fortran. I mean, you get to have yeah. someone good like spend a lot of time just to make the basics that you just get out of the box with Java. So that's that's what you get from any part of that performance sure. uh, loss. And I feel like I feel like, you know most people, I think, most developers would argue that they can develop faster uh, in Java than in Fortran. Yeah. And right, so we've got competing bottlenecks to some extent. Right. Performance CPU is sometimes a bottleneck for us. Programmer time is often a bottleneck for us. Right. So I think it's a matter of balancing those priorities project by project. And sometimes even finer grained. And again, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, Java is associated with Oracle, uh, or it was associated with Sun, and then Oracle bought Sun. Oracle sucks. Um, but there are other JVM implementations, so you're not actually tied to, the, to Oracle. Uh, interestingly, you're not tied to the, the uh, JVM either. There are multiple... Um, major uh, implementations of um, Clojure running on different hosts. Uh, the other big one is ClojureScript, uh, which, for which, in a, in a sense, JavaScript itself and the web are, uh, are the host environment. ClojureScript ends up being compiled down to JavaScript, treating JavaScript as an assembly language. Uh, which is nice because it means you can use Clojure to program the web. Uh, but the point, and there are other people are working on um, implementations for uh, .NET. I'm not sure how far that's gone at this point. But the point is, the point is, you are not really tied to that particular JVM infrastructure if the Java community were to, you know, go insane or be shut down in some weird way. Um, Performant. We talked a little about that. I'll I'll get into it again. So that's, that's why Clojure, right? I mean, Clojure is a modern functional Lisp on the JVM, and that is, a, I think, a combination of advantages that is pretty tough to beat. Um, and finally, it's just, it's a joy. It's a joy to work with. It looks, in, it looks insane, it, right? It looks insane and weird and backward and alien when you first start dealing with it. But it's like driving in another country or something, right? I mean, it seems weird. Or, right, I mean, it's like um, learning a natural language, right? I mean, uh, to kind of steal an analogy from, from Rich Hickey, um, you know, German seems really confusing and bizarre to me. That's just because I don't know German, right? I mean, if I spent a little time learning German, it wouldn't feel like that. Maybe it would. I don't know. Uh, but but I have never, I mean, in a career of, I don't know, 10 or 15 languages over the years, I've never, I've never liked a language this much. It's beautiful. It's just, it's beautiful and good and effective and practical. I've, I really like it, which is why I've gone on at length. <laughs> Uh, so that, that kind of covers the major things. There's a couple other little points I want to hit. Um, performance is the big one. I mean, it's, it's an important question. Um, again, there's a history of stereotypes, uh, right? I mean, in 2015, the JVM is fast. In 2015, Lisp is fast. These things were not true 
you know? They were not true even in 2000 in the case of, J, of the JBM. Uh, they were definitely not true in 1980 uh, in the case of LISP, and the JBM didn't even exist. Um, but, you know, I mean, those, those stereotypes may be dated. Um, closure is a dynamic language in terms of, of, of typing, variable typing. Um, that can be slow. But in closure, if you have a performance critical section, you can make that section statically typed in a number of different ways or provide type hints to the compiler that let you make that section uh, much more performant. Um, again, I think a lot of the instincts that we have about performance, those of us who have been in, you know, programmers or, 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 or written code for an extended period of time, because just the field has changed so much. Uh, Moore's Law has, has gone a long way. Um, compilers are generally better than people now in a majority of cases. Uh, and a lot of times they are not even doing what you think they're doing. Like our instincts about what low level code is, like they're, they're, they turn out in a lot of cases to be wrong. There are some wild examples of that where the compiler is doing something you would not expect at all. And the general, I think the general approach that's recommended is, right, I mean, wait until you know something is slow Profile it, find out why, because again, our instincts are often wrong. We don't know what the bottlenecks are, performance-wise, and then fix the parts that are that are the bottlenecks. I'm not at all saying don't consider performance until the end of your your project, but I think to some extent we have to battle our instincts about about trying to wring every bit of performance out of our code. Uh, at minimum, you can match Java performance with Closure. Uh, worst case, as you do in some other languages, you can drop to, to C or to Fortran for the, the most performance critical bits if you absolutely have to do that. I won't say that's super fun, but it's definitely doable. Um, uh, yeah, it's a quote from a great article called, uh, by Paul Graham. Lisp started out powerful and over the next 20 years got fast. Mainstream languages started out fast and over the next 40 years gradually got more powerful until now the most advanced of them are fairly close to Lisp. Uh, and that is from an amazing essay by him called Revenge of the Nerds, which I link in the resources. Speaking of which, resources. Um, I didn't actually mean to do the slow reveal on these. <laughs> but here's a number of them. Um, I will send these around. Uh, Closure.org, obviously. Um, simple made easy. I don't like learning about programming from talks and videos. I imagine not all of you do either, so sorry. Um, but this talk, I mean, this kind of changed my life as a programmer. This is, it, 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 changed, it changed everything for me. I feel like it made me realize I needed to learn programming all over again in a way that now I think is so much better. Light Table is an editor that makes um, closure programming very accessible and easy, and you don't have to screw around with how you run it and syntax and all that stuff. It just gives you a lot of that. A um, couple of books, depending on what your learning style is. That's that Paul Graham essay. Uh, and uh, our team uh, just got the, um, uh, this GSC rejuvenation team just got uh, this book, Functional Programming for the Object-Oriented Programmer, if you happen to have... Um, Object-oriented instincts. It's a really nice uh, book that helps you sort of uh, make that particular leap. Uh, that is it. I will um, refer you again to this poster. Um, and here is from <laughs> some footage from an earlier from a uh, uh, early Soviet propaganda film, which I thought perhaps might be. Representative of my approach here. <laughs> no, I'm really taking it just off with that poster. Which I thought was hilarious. Um, so that is it. Thank you for your patience. Um, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. Yes. How, how much time would you say you spent working with closure before you felt like you had a good handle on it? Um, in probably 2011 or so. Um, I took a short stab at it and rewrote 
a couple of pure algorithms in Clojure um, and didn't really make the leap, I would say. I mean, I didn't go, I didn't go far enough. Um, this time around, I have, um, God, I've been doing it roughly since um, December, uh, just on my own time, right? Not as of now, I've, I've not had the opportunity to work with it here. Um, but just working on a side project, now uh, I have reached the point where it is much more natural for me to think in closure than to think in, say, Python or Java. Yeah. Yeah, yeah probably something like that. Yeah. Again, right? And it seemed, I mean, that's the thing, right? And, and, and that Rich Hickey talk goes into the simple made easy, goes into it in a really nice way. We are suckers for easy. Right? A language that we look at and immediately looks familiar. We love that. We're like, that's a great language. Um, closure is really unfamiliar. But once you get over that unfamiliarity, it's easier. Paradoxically. Uh, other questions? We have 15 minutes. You want to show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, again, right? It's just going to look, it's going to look so alien. It's going to look insane. Don't be put off by the fact that it looks insane. Um, <coughs> I think I can maybe get this to go put up there. I don't know. Evidently not that way. Um, so here's some code I wrote recently uh, just to generate the Fibonacci sequence um, in Clojure. A friend of mine is learning JavaScript for the first time and uh, uh, was um, posted his, his uh, JavaScript implementation. And I was like, cool, that's cool. This is, you know, just for what it's worth, this is how I would um, approach this in Clojure. Let me make sure my, none of my, do I have any porn marked or anything? Um, no, it doesn't look like it. Um, so here, right, as a point of comparison, right, is a way, one way that you might generate part of the Fibonacci sequence in Fortran. Um, <coughs> in particular, right, I would point out that you're creating a number of variables that are not representing something that you ultimately care about. You're creating them kind of as placeholders that you need. And again, right, this loop, right, you don't, you don't really care about the idea of looping. Um, looping is not something you want to do. Looping is something that you feel like you have to do in order to express the thing that you really want to express. Um, here is how I wrote it, at least, in, in Clojure. Um, semicolons are comments. Uh, so the first thing is, right, we want to describe, like, given, given one step of the Fibonacci sequence, how do we get to the next step, right? If the current step is AB, then the next step is B, A plus B, next, by definition. So next Fib, right, uh, given A and B, it's B and then A plus B. The infix notation there, where the plus comes first, that's another thing that looks super alien and horrible to people at first. Huh? Um, tiny note, generally use a plus. I'm using, I'm adding that character because it just gives you this handy thing that if it overflows short integers, you get into long automatically. Is that a macro? I don't remember. I mean, it's built, to, it's, it's, it's core closure. Uh, yeah, but but I don't remember whether it's implemented as a macro or not. Uh, so given that definition, right, what we really want to think about is we want to think about the infinite sequence obtained by taking that and repeatedly applying it, starting with 0 to 1. Right? So the definition of, of the Fibonacci sequence is iterating the, the next fib starting from 0 and 1. That's it. That gives you the whole infinite sequence. Obviously, if you try to realize all of it at once, 
<laughs> your computer will explode. Um, but, right, I mean, we don't really want to represent some finite subset of it. That's not what we're thinking about. We're, we're trying to think about the sequence in and of itself, the mathematical sequence. So what we do is, in, in this lazy way, we, we, we just say, this is, this, is the, this is all of them. And then we realize as many um, as we need to, right? We just say nth, right? We want the, you know, the thousandth Fibonacci sequence. Oh, and Imka, I'm sorry. I realized, I didn't know I was going to show this code. I realize it's not. Yeah, I made him do it. Uh, so you're kind of like you got. I'll send a link out to it if you're interested in taking a look later. So the last line there, I was kind of what I was wondering is like you have all these functions defined, but you've got to kick it off somewhere. So is it is it kind of the common entry point? Is you have like one function that's kind of like your main function, like the last one? Well, not necessarily in the REPL. You could type in sort of you could access or or type fibs directly, so you can do it interactively. Um, because it's the, the fibs function has been defined and it's sort of in the global namespace, if you will, mm -hmm. at that point. Um, and in this example, the print one there at the very bottom is what gets everything rolling and actually takes an action and sort of suddenly prints out the thousandth member of that scene. Yeah, it's more like it's more like Python, right? This is not a, like a class definition. Right, right. That's it's a, a script. So we define a function, we define another function, and then we run. Run one thing. Right, so I'm, I'm thinking of the last function, line 15, is kind of like your main or your, you know, it's probably not good to put those words in, but just, is that typically how you actually execute closures? You just have one line that calls a function, which calls a function, which calls a function, which... Just depends on, well... It shows um, the console, like, the entry point to the console, which has got the only main and defined something <clears throat> in our console thing. Oh, oh, oh. There is sort of a line again main. There's a formalism for right. when you build an actual application. There's yeah. something kind of called main, and it bootstraps everything from there. And that's essentially, although that's, that's basically like if you want to run at the command line, right? Because that's under the hood on some level. In some sense, you're running Java. You're calling Java minus CP, blah, 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 a bunch of params. And Java wants... Uh, does it, yeah, Java, does Java want a main function yeah. inherently? Java, I forget. Yeah. For, for a console, yeah. So there, there's kind of a mapping, but you know, the, the REPL environment doesn't require any sort of actual main. Yeah. The, the, the code that you showed before you showed this file. Uh huh. Was that closure code? Oh, oh no, that was Fortran. Sorry. All right. I should have said that. Um, uh, so here, right? I mean, actually here just for fun, is a, um, a closure REPL, right? I'm just running in a terminal window. Uh, and so we can, we can just put that right in, right? I mean, we can just say, look, we want to define this function. And we want to define this function. Boom. Uh, and then... Um, and then we want the thousandth member of that sequence. Boom. Fast. Um, and in some ways, right, even faster than you might think, because let's just time that function. Uh, uh, you know what I really want to do is start this over, because in some sense that's already loaded, some of it's already loaded into memory, uh, but I've got five minutes, so I don't. But here, I'm going to say time, do it again, and just give me the time. Um, and it's nothing, right? It's two milliseconds, because it's already got some of that. What? Tell you what, tell you what, I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll open another REPL just in case. But, um, Furthermore, if we were to say, oh, now I want the uh, 800th. I, oh, and I can tell you on my machine, I think that would take, um, it'd take about 10 milliseconds to run the first time. Uh, but say I want the 800th one, I still get it for free, right, in less than two milliseconds, because now it's realized the sequence up to that point. So it's no problem to just pick something out from earlier in the sequence. If I were to say... Is that, is that some sort of state? Is it, is it, um, I mean, in some ways, okay. that's kind of a, a, a state, but I guess because it's immutable. It's because it's immutable. It's, it's, it's yeah, 
and we've not, I think, got time to get quite all the way into that. Um, if you were to say, give me the 1,000 and first, it would give me pretty. It would basically give me that for free, two two milliseconds, because uh, it only has to actually realize one more member of that sequence. And uh, yeah, just for fun, I don't know. Let's let's get the ten thousandth. So where is it storing the thousand thousand numbers when you ask for the thousand? In memory, just in memory. I mean, in what sense? That that they, they, those have been defined as the sequence called fibs. Well, the REPL session has its own like state yeah. of what's happened before, but it's all immutable stuff. Exactly. Although you can, if you would prefer, just tie it directly to your app in any number of ways. So that as you're doing things in your app, maybe maybe your app is putting up a website or something, you can be interacting with that, and stuff here in the console will represent, will uh, will reflect that. Uh, so just for the hell of it, let's see the ten thousandth one. Um, that's mostly new, and that you know, how it takes it, fourteen milliseconds. So it's kind of fast. And it's good that you can have there's a memoize sort of feature. So a lot of things are really pains in the ass, like thread problems kind of just pop out for free because yeah. you can just say memoize this uh, like thing and it'll just do everything that you would normally have to do in an imperative language like set up your intermediate variables and get your data structures ready. It's all just magically done for you. Some mm -hmm. sense of magic. And Clojure also has transactional state or state transactional memory kind of baked in, which is its big kind of you know, language decision which basically kind of acts like database-y in the sense that it gives you very mm. strong guarantees yes, of right. consistency. So you never have to worry about any threading problem ever, which is great. Generally, right? I mean, you could still, you could still get thread locking, but you gotta, you got to work for you, it. you got to get to work for it. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's leave it at that. As we're gonna <laughs> or, or maybe we've got a minute if, if anybody else has any other quick questions. Well, so I know there's one from, 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 yeah. from a practical standpoint, things I have done here and used to, I actually am worried about memory being used up. Uh -huh. and, and when and when I don't, when my process no longer really needs that memory to be hanging around, yeah, uh, I want to get it freed up. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not hogging the system for other from other people. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So I'm thinking, okay, a thousand numbers, whatever, ten thousand numbers, whatever. But I, I might have fifty four gigabytes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 maybe thirty of those gigabytes my process doesn't need from this stage yeah. forward. Yeah, and I yeah, need to, And I should release it. So, I mean, I imagine you have that capability. Yeah. But, but you, sometimes you need to, no matter what language you're working in, you got to keep that in mind. And you sure. You might need to free up some memory. Like like Java, and really because it's it's running on, on the JVM, <coughs> um, it's, a, it's a garbage collected language. So, you, if you, you can create uh, that's one of the places where state really does come in very handy. You can say, hey, I want this little piece of state, and I want to do all of my stuff and attach it to this piece of state. Uh, and then if you throw away that state, then that huge amount of memory, that's free to be garbage collected and, and will be pretty quickly. Oh. And you can drop them to Java level. You know, the, we, didn't, we didn't really show any of how easy it is to interoperate with Java directly, but it's really elegant. There's the hundred thousandth fib. Two sort of seconds. I don't know. Just curious. I've never taken it up that high before. All right, let's leave it there. Thanks so much, y'all. Um, well, thank you. And again, please feel free to re use me as a resource later, because uh, I'm super psyched about this stuff. And is that Comic Sans? Huh? Yeah. Is that Comic oh, thanks, Sans? Sir. You on your way out, Art? Comic Sans? Good God, yeah, no. no way. All right, see you later. Oh, over that. That's really just cool. some, I don't know, that's some random website that lets you put code oh, on. I was just, I was just giving you three. <laughs> <laughs>